programs you've seen this weekend or any other weekend on Book TV. Call 1-800-C-SPAN-98 for pricing information and to request a tape. Journalist Eileen Welsom spent a decade tracking secret government medical experiments dealing with plutonium. In 1994, she won a Pulitzer Prize for her reports. This book, The Plutonium Files, expands on those stories. Ms. Welsom talked about her research during a visit to a Rochester, New York bookstore. gentlemen. I'd like to welcome all of you to Barnes & Noble this evening, and I'd also like to ext extend a special welcome to our guest, Pulitzer Prize winning author Eileen Welsom. Eileen Welsom's book, The Plutonium Files, America's Secret Medical Experiments in the Cold War, presents the astonishing story of government-sponsored radiation experiments conducted over a 30-year period with the unknowing help of American citizens. These citizens included pregnant women given radioactive iron cocktails, mentally retarded young boys who were fed radioactive oatmeal, and many chronically ill patients who had no idea the role they were playing. Many of these individuals' lives are discussed in the book. The doctors and scientists involved included some at the University of Rochester who worked in secret and experimented on Rochesterians. The Plutonium Files examines the chasm between the government's hidden experiments and the truth the book reveals. The Plutonium File goes well beyond Welsom's original series of articles, which first appeared in 1994 in the Albuquerque Tribune and won her the Pulitzer Prize. Her book sheds light on our country's history and examines the ethical, medical, and governmental regulations and codes which were ignored or rationalized in order for this testing to occur. Eileen Welsom graduated from the University of Texas in 1980 and has worked for 15 years as a journalist for newspapers in Texas and New Mexico. During her newspaper career, she has received some of the highest awards in journalism, including the 1994 Pulitzer Prize, in journalism for national reporting for her series of articles which appeared in the Albuquerque Journal, Tribune, pardon me. In addition to the Pulitzer, Ms. Welsom has received the George Polk Award for reporting, the Selden Ring Award for investigative reporting, and the Investigative Reporters and Editors Gold Medal. She currently resides in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Ms. Welsom. It's a great honor to be here tonight, and it's the largest book signing that I've had. And it's my last stop on the book tour, and I'm just really overwhelmed to see all my friends and people I've talked with for years. It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a fantastic thing to see everybody out there, and thank you for having me. Um, I guess I'll just whip right into what I have to say, since a lot of you know a lot about it anyway. Um, a lot of times in these past few weeks I have been asked about how I got onto this story, and I'm sure you've all, some of you have heard about the footnote. And for those of you who haven't, I'll go through that story once again, and, and, and the footnote is what led to this book. One footnote led to this book. So it kind of is a lesson to always read the footnotes or perhaps not read footnotes depending on um, how, how long you want to work on a project. Um, in 1987, uh, just a few months after I started at the Albuquerque Tribune, 
I was doing a story, a local story, about Kirtland Air Force Base. And um, in the process of, of working on that story, the public information officer had a very thick volume about the Air Force efforts to clean up its waste sites across the country. So I opened the book and looked at what they were planning to clean up in Albuquerque. And I noticed that they had uh, several radioactive animal dumps on the, on the Air Force base that were targeted for cleanup. And I, I love animals, so I wanted to know, first of all, what kind of animals did they use? And secondly, why were they radioactive? So in the course of the next few days, I, I poked around and got the uh, public information officer for what was uh, then called the Air Force Special Weapons Lab. And um, he gathered together a stack of these reports for me. And one afternoon, I went over to the base and read them. It was a Friday afternoon. And I soon realized that I was not going to find a story for the daily paper. But having badgered this man for all those reports, I felt obliged to read on. And toward the end of the afternoon, my eye fell on the footnote, and it described 18 humans who had been injected with plutonium. And I had been reading all about dogs that they had injected with plutonium or who had, had been intubated and then the plutonium had been put in their stomachs and they observed them, the animals as they developed radiation sickness and died. And so I was reading in that context, I was stunned by the idea that the United States government had used 18 of its own citizens um, in this fashion. And the ver so I jotted down the citation, and the very next day, which was a Saturday, I went over to the university library and tried to find that report. I didn't find that report, but I found other scientific reports by that doctor and others. And that began my long investigation. I, I, I opened a manila folder, I put that report in, and um, the following Monday I went to the paper and told him that I had a great story. And Corey Ireland would probably appreciate this from the Rochester paper. Um, my editor said, well, that's a great story. I told him about the injections. And they said, well, that's a great story. But we hired you to be the neighborhood writer. And, and I, I, my editors, in all defense, I, I, if you're a daily newspaper reporter, you feed the beast. I mean, that's what you do. You, you can't, we don't have the luxury of going back and doing historical kinds of, 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 of reporting. So I just continued to work on my own between other assignments. And I contacted, uh, uh, I followed the report trail, footnote to footnote, and I also tried to track down doctors and scientists who may have had some connection with this experiment. And at the same time that I did that, I also filed Freedom of Information Act requests with the Department of Energy and um, with any agency that might have records. Um, Los Alamos National Laboratory told me they, that they, they knew nothing about this experiment and in fact denied that it occurred even though it was the subject of a congressional report in 1986. The Department of Energy sent me um, a few documents on which anything that, that might have identified these patients had been whited out. And in some cases, the, the names of the scientists had also been deleted. So um, the years went by, and I, I learned a lot more about this experiment. Not the names of the patient, but the experiment itself. I learned that it had been performed by the doctors and scientists working for the Manhattan Project, which was the top secret effort to build the atomic bomb. And I learned that three patients had been injected in Berkeley, Three patients had been injected in Chicago. One patient had been injected at the Manhattan District's Army Hospital in Oak Ridge. And 11 patients had been injected here at the uh, Strong Memorial Hospital run by the University of Rochester. So, and I learned that um, 
the primary reason that they embarked upon this experiment is that they were, uh, plutonium was a brand new element. Um, they had perhaps, uh, the plutonium they had at the time would have fit on the head of a pin when they be began the bomb project. They knew that in um, a few short years they would produ be producing kilograms of plutonium and they while they didn't have any plutonium to do any kind of experiments with, they assumed that it would behave like radium. And they knew a lot about radium from the dial painters in the 20s who developed cancers. Um, and it caused a national outcry, uh, an international outcry, really. And many of the Manhattan Project doctors were aware of the radium dial painter tragedy. They were young men. Um, when this was being publicized, and all those cases were settled out of court. Well, as the Manhattan Project progressed, um, and they were bringing the factories online that would produce plutonium, a uh, scientist named Robley Evans published a report in a 1943 uh, journal. And in that report, I found this when I was writing my book, he had a, a picture of a dial painter, a young woman who had maybe one microgram, one and a half micrograms of radium in her body and who had developed an, an enormous tumor. Um, so they knew at that point that a millionth of a gram of this new stuff could be potentially fatal. And, and the report sent uh, shivers through the bomb complex. In, in addition to that, there were a number of accidents and spills and uh, uh, an increase in contamination as the, as the project progressed. So um, they did uh, a lot of animal experiments at Berkeley, at the University of Chicago, here, here at the University of Rochester's uh, secret bomb program, which was known as the Manhattan Department or the Manhattan Annex. Um, they were doing a lot of animal experiments with uranium and with plutonium. Well, the time came that they decided that this data was not sufficient, that they needed humans for, uh, for their research project. And at that point, they held a meeting in Los Alamos um, in the spring of 1945, in which all the scientists got together and swapped data on what they knew about plutonium. And J. Robert Oppenheimer, who directed the bomb project in Los Alamos was coming in and out of the meeting. And at that point, the decision was made to go ahead and perform the injections. And the first person who was injected was a man named Ed Cade um, at the Army Hospital in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. He was an African American. He had been involved in an auto accident the day after this meeting in Los Alamos, and several, several weeks later, uh, he was injected with plutonium that had been shipped to Oak Ridge by Wright Langham, a chemist at Los Alamos. Um, I also learned uh, soon after that first injection, they did two more injections in quick succession. Uh, a gentleman in Chicago by the name of Arthur Hubbard was injected with plutonium. He had a mouth cancer. And a man by the name of Albert Stevens, who was a house painter in Hillsburg, California, was also injected with plutonium. Those were the three injections that were carried out during the war. And the bulk of the injections occurred in the post-war period and all the Rochester injections occurred in 1945 and 1946. In fact, three days after Japan surrendered Wright Langham, the Los Alamos chemist came here to the University of Rochester where he met with a number of scientists and doctors who were working at the Manhattan Annex or the Manhattan Department, which was its code name, and they um, developed a protocol for the uh, injection. That protocol, by the way, was not made public until the mid-90s. Um, so I kind of got ahead of myself on the, on the injections, but let me go back um, to the 90s.
uh, and, and finding these people. As I mentioned, I found out a lot about the experiment. Uh, all these individuals were known by code number only, no identities. Um, so what, did I, what could I do? How could I find 18 people in a country of hundreds of millions of people? I did a very crude thing. I uh, put everything I knew about each of these 18 patients on 18 sheets of yellow paper, just like this. And as I got documents in, I would scan those records very carefully. And if there was even a kernel of information, I would write it down on that person's yellow paper. So I went off on a sabbatical uh, for a year, left my folder behind me, came back. Um, I worked at a small uh, courthouse press room in downtown Albuquerque, uh, came back to the paper. Coffee cups that I had used 10 months ago were still sitting there on the filing cabinets. Um, and I pulled out my folder again. And a miracle happened. There, I looked down on the page, and I saw the words that would unlock the story. And what I saw was this. The document stated that a government scientist had contacted the physician of Cal 3 in Italy, Texas. Italy, Texas were the words that opened this story for me. And here's why. I knew Italy was a small town, having grown up in Texas and gone to school there. And I knew a lot about Cal 3 by then. I knew he was an African American who would have been about 80 years old who had had his left leg amputated in July of 1947, three days after he had been injected in the calf with plutonium. So I thought, I, I saw Italy, I, th I thought, I can find this man, even if it means going door to door. But finding him was not that difficult. I called direct directory assistance and described this man. And the lady on the other end said, you're looking for Elmer Allen. Would you like his wife's, he died a year ago. Would you like his wife's number? So I want to turn to the book and tell you what I did from there. <clears throat> Suddenly the windowless press room seemed to be swimming with light, but I think it was because I was holding my breath. The minute I got the number, I thanked the lady, hung up, and dialed Mrs. Allen. She answered on the first or second ring. Without going into a lot of detail, I described a little of what I knew about the experiment. Fredna Allen was very pleasant, but didn't want to meet with me until she had discussed the matter with her daughter, Elmerine Allen Whitfield. When I asked Mrs. Allen if I could contact Elmerine directly, she readily agreed and gave me her number in Dallas. Elmerine listened intently while I told her about the experiment and why I thought her father had been one of the patients. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity of silence, she said, okay, you can come on. She gave me instructions to her home and said that her mother would meet us there. The following afternoon, I arrived in Dallas and checked into a hotel near the airport. Since I wasn't scheduled to meet Fredna and Elmarine until the following morning, I decided to drive down to Italy. When I pulled into one of the parking spaces on Main Street, a glaze of heat and dust lay over everything. The town seemed completely deserted, as if everybody were off at a funeral. The storefronts looked like they had been punched from cardboard. Suddenly, the possibility that Elmer Allen and Cal 3 were the same person seemed like a long shot. What could Italy, Texas have to do with the Manhattan Project? But luck was with me that day. When I stepped out of my car, I saw an African-American man who could have been anywhere from 60 to 80 years old sitting on one of the benches. He had just slipped off his leather cowboy boots and was wriggling his feet in obvious relief. His name was Joe Speed. I asked him if he knew Elmer Allen. They had been good friends, he told me. We talked for a little while. Then I asked him if Elmer had ever said anything about how he lost his leg or the long ago hospitalization in San Francisco. Joe Speed's eyes swept the deserted street and then focused on a spot somewhere in front of his feet. Elmer, he began, had talked about the doctors who bustled in and out of his hospital room practicing 
to be doctors. Quote, he told me they put a germ cancer in his leg. They guinea pigged him. They didn't care about him getting well. He told me he never would get well. Joe Speed delivered this information swiftly, then looked at me sideways as if to say he didn't believe the story either. But his comments were a powerful confirmation that Elmer and Cal Three were indeed the same person. So, I, after my trip to Italy, I returned to the paper, and they got excited about the story. We got our attorneys in Washington to file a very detailed seven-page FOIA, and to aid them in their search for documents, we attached our own documents, our own skimpy documents with, that we had gleaned over the years. While that was going on, I was assigned to do other stories. So I had to, again, leave this story for a little while. And then in the spring of 1993, I returned to it full time. And I contacted, I tracked down a physician named Christine Waterhouse, who uh, cared, I knew that two of the patients in Rochester had lived for a long time. And I learned that Christine Waterhouse had been their physician. And I tracked her down. She was living out of state and retired. And I called her and I asked her about this experiment. And I asked her if she had remembered those individuals that she cared for. And she told me um, right off the bat that she could remember one of those individuals. And she said his name was John Musso. But she said she didn't know where he lived or if he had any children or not. So that began another paper chase. Um, I got a hold of a genealogist here in, in Rochester who got all the, all the musos out of the Rochester phone book for me and sent them to me. And I began calling all of them at odd hours, um, trying to uh, reach somebody who may have known this John Musso. And one evening, one hot summer evening, I reached a wonderful man named Jerry Musso, who said to me, you know, that sounds a lot like my uncle. And he gave me the name of a relative of a son, John Musso's son, Robert, and a phone number who was not living in Rochester, but was living in a, a small town outside of Rochester. And I called Robert, and in fact, he said that Christine Waterhouse was his physician and that his fa father had suffered from Addison's disease. And I knew from my records that this particular plutonium injectee had suffered from Addison's disease. So I felt uh, I, I had found my next patient, um, the identity of my next patient. I found a, um, I found a third Rochester patient um, from a stack of records that we received from the Department of Energy in response to our FOIA requests. And I want to read you just a little bit about how I found the second Rochester patient. One afternoon, I received a thick manila envelope of documents from the Energy Department. My response to these packages was nearly always the same, a sense of anticipation followed by sharp disappointment as I skimmed the contents and realized the envelope contained mostly duplicate and triplicate copies of scientific reports and press releases that I already had. This thick package promised to be no different. Nevertheless, I took it home that night and dumped the contents onto the floor of my living room. Carefully, I sorted through the papers. Mixed in with the official reports were records that I hadn't seen before. Perhaps something on one of those papers, a word or a phrase, might yield information that would lead to more names. I examined each page carefully, looking at dates, signatures, even the declassification stamps. From the stack, I pulled out one document. It was an unsigned and undated note on which the following words were scrawled. Charlton died 198 question mark. My mind immediately leapt 
to the two unidentified Rochester patients, a man and a woman who had participated in the follow-up studies and died in the 1980s. Could Charlton be the last name of one of those patients? From my reporting, I knew that Christine Waterhouse had cared for those two patients. She was retired and living in Maine, and I had spoken to her on the phone several times. Although she was pleasant enough, she couldn't remember much about the study. This was war, she said during one of our first interviews. There were a lot of things condoned for the good of the many. I put the scrap of paper in my notepad and went to bed. When I arrived in the newsroom the following morning, I dialed Christine Waterhouse's number again. Was Charlton the name of one of your patients, I asked her, slowly spelling out the last name. Edith Charlton. That's the first time I remembered it. Edith Charlton. Now that you bring that up, I do remember her better. I, I did take care of her for a long time, too. Of course, her first name was Ida, not Edith. Although Waterhouse said she didn't think Ida had any close relatives, I began calling funeral homes in Canandaigua, New York, where Ida had died. If she did have any relatives, the funeral home that handled her burial arrangements would have their names. From one of those funeral homes, I eventually discovered that she indeed had a son, Luther Fred Schultz, and that he was li living in Geneva, New York. And later that morning, I found myself talking on the phone with Fred Schultz and his wife, Helen, who were really lovely people, uh, both of whom are deceased now, and they told me an awful lot about Ida. Uh, they, they made her soups and stews and took them to the nursing homes. They, they took her for years to her appointments uh, at Dr. Waterhouse's uh, office here in Rochester. Um, and with their help, or with their permission, I was able to obtain from Strong Memorial Hospital Ida's medical records, and there were over 300 pages of those records, and nowhere, not on one page, was the word plutonium. Um, and the documents that were released in the mid-90s in, in mid, uh, showed that that was a conscious decision on the part of the Manhattan Project doctors. They segregated any information related to the plutonium injections from the patient's files in order not to, um, I suppose, not to have anybody find out what had gone on. So, um, uh, it, it, I continued um, my research and using these kinds of clues, I was able to identify uh, Fred Sowers and Arthur, H uh, uh, excuse me, Albert Stevens, the first California patient that I mentioned earlier who was injected with plutonium. So now we had the names of five of the 18 patients. And we decided this was all I had, I had exhausted every, I thought I had exhausted every piece of information I could find. I could go no further. I could not identify the rest of these people. And um, we went to press. Uh, three weeks later, uh, the story got a, got a dramatic, uh, a, a, a tremendous amount of attention when Energy Secretary Hazel O'Leary uh, stood up at a press conference in Washington and admitted that the Department of Energy's predecessors had, in fact, conduct, conducted this experiment. And what was significant to me as a reporter was that she admitted that she was appalled and deeply shocked by this experiment. So um, with O'Leary's admission, uh, the, leg develop, uh, the story developed legs, as we say in the newspaper business. And all hell began to break loose in our newsroom and in newsrooms all over the country. Um, her admission uh, triggered an outpouring of interest from people around the country. Um, uh, atomic veterans who had participated in tests in Nevada and in the Pacific, hospital patients who felt they had been used in studies in the 40s and 50s, contacted their newspapers. There were um, 
There was a study that was done up in Massachusetts at a school for the mentally retarded where the, the, the young boys were given radioactive oatmeal and then, um, and then encouraged to participate in what the science, uh, what the scientists, what the MIT scientists referred to as a science club. And so in exchange for participating in this experiment, the boys were taken to ball games and given Mickey Mouse watches and armbands. And uh, neither they nor their parents uh, were informed of, of the exact nature of this experiment or that radioactive isotopes were used. And the stories continued to flood out. It turned out that, that um, one of the more notorious cases that I write about uh, was a study involving 820 pregnant women at a prenatal clinic in Nashville, Tennessee, who were given radioactive iron cocktails when they went for checkups. And uh, I went to, uh, uh, in writing my book, I went to Nashville and I interviewed a number of these women who are now grandmothers, and I interviewed their children about um, the effects of, of, of this long go exposure. And I just want to read briefly so that you get an idea of some of the other studies that were done in other parts of the country, just a little bit about this particular uh, study. Um, and the person that I'm going to talk about is Helen Hutchison. But, uh, in July of 1946, Helen Hutchison signed in at the reception desk and took a seat in the waiting room. A ceiling fan spun lazily overhead, but did, did little to relieve the muggy Nashville heat. Helen's husband had landed in Europe on D-Day, and had helped liberate two concentration camps, including Buchenwald. Although they weren't exactly poor, money was tight. Helen plucked at her damp clothes and fanned her face. Just 20 years old, she was a willowy woman with long, curly hair, who talked in a slow, unhurried voice. She had experienced so much nausea and vomiting during her pregnancy that she had actually lost 15 pounds. The doctors prescribed liver shots, vitamins, thyroid medication, and plenty of bed rest, but the nausea continued unabated. When Helen's name was called, she followed the nurse down the hallway to an examining room. Soon a doctor came in, mixed something into a cup, and handed it to her to drink. As Helen sat on the examining table, Holding the cup in her hand, she looked out the window at Gartland Avenue, parked at the curb where DeSoto's, Packard's, and Studebaker's. Beyond were the lovely brick homes and deep green lawns of Nashville. At the corner of Gartland Avenue and 21st Street was a pie wagon, a streetcar that had been converted to a soda fountain. After her checkup at the, Clinton, at the clinic, Helen sometimes slipped onto one of the stools and ordered a Coke hoping the carbonated sweetness would staunch the nausea welling up inside her. It was such a beautiful day, she thought, as the physician urged her to swallow the drink. What is it, she asked. It's a little cocktail. It'll make you feel better, she recalled him saying. Well, I don't know if I ought to be drinking a cocktail, she responded, her voice light and bannering. Drink it all, he told her. Drink it on down. The concoction was fizzy and sweet like a cherry Coke. It wasn't bad tasting. Um, Helen told me that after she gave birth to her daughter, uh, she um, developed these strange blisters on her face. And she said you could draw a line right down in the middle of her face. And the blisters were on one side. And she's had um, numerous problems since then and suffers today from pernicious anemia. Her daughter, who was a fetus at the time, uh, has an immune system disorder and also suffers from skin cancers uh, on places where she doesn't see the sun, where she doesn't get sun, small of her back, places like that. Um, so, um, boy, let me go on here. Um, what I found. Uh, uh, after Secretary O'Leary announced that they were going to get to the bottom of these experiments and people began calling the DOE and they set up a hotline, what I found in looking at the records 
was that there was a tremendous amount of research that was done, particularly radiation research, um, after, after the war. It, it expanded greatly. What they did during the war was really quick and dirty studies. And um, a lot of the Manhattan Project doctors who were involved in the plutonium injections, in particular, I'm thinking of Stafford Warren, who taught here at the University of Rochester for many years and was recruited by General Leslie Groves to be the medical director of the Manhattan Project's medical section. Uh, they, he and his assistant, Heimer Friedel, went to Japan and they arrived there, oh, 30 to 45 days after the bombings. And I think what they saw terrified them because the people were still getting sick when they got there. They, they, were, they, 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 had, they had crude shelters set up. Uh, there were first aid stations. They were getting bandaged. They were still suffering from nausea and vomiting, hair loss, burns. Um, it was a, just a, a, a horrendous um, situation. And I think that it affects, this is my feeling, um, nothing that I gleaned from a document. My feeling is, is that it, it, sh it really shocked them. And they, they came back to the United States and they thought, my God, what have we wrought? And they felt that they had to know everything they could, not only they, but the military, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Civilian Atomic Energy Commission, the, you know, the Civil Defense. They had to learn everything they could about the offensive and defensive applications of nuclear war. They believed that the next war was going to be fought on an atomic battlefield. So with those kinds of things going on, with the, uh, with the Cold War deepening, um, there was a, a vast expansion in radiation research. Now, a lot of this research, a lot of these experiments, I want to emphasize, were uh, tracer, what they call tracer studies, in which minute quantities of radioactive materials were given to patients, where they either drank them like Helen did, or uh, uh, imbibed them through, or ingested them through some other means. Um, and I, I, a lot of scientists um, contend that these tracer studies probably did cause no harm. And I am inclined to agree with them on that. So I, I really need to point that out so that uh, y y I don't want to be an alarmist here. But what was, what, what was unsettling and unethical about the experiments I looked at was that, um, in, for example, the radioactive oatmeal studies at Fernald, um, the scientists at MIT in the mid-90s did calculations and said, oh, those doses are harmless. You'd get more in Santa Fe, New Mexico in a year. But my point is that if all these thousands of tracer experiments were harmless, then why didn't they tell the patients, I want to do this, I'd like to use, I'm looking to see where this material goes, would you be agreeable to drinking it? And they didn't do that. So I have one problem um, with that uh, theory. So. Um, and another reason they did all these tracer studies was because um, the Manhattan Project doctors were really eager to, to, not only the doctors but the scientists, they were really eager to um, tout the beneficial effects of the atom. And so they were desperate to find something good and of course it did it, it was the beginning and the birth of nuclear medicine and radiation is a therapeutic tool that is still important today and in Oak Ridge <laughs> where they made the first plutonium they um, began making lots of these tracers these radioactive um, materials uh, such as iodine and iron and calcium and strontium and cesium and they would ship them to qualified researchers throughout the country so there were thousands of these tracer studies done at military bases and at uh, civilian hospitals and so on and people have asked me well what about this uh, university could they have done it here or or what about that university it, it was it's like 
it's like research today in genetics. It 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 was uh, the AEC was a fueled. It was a huge engine of research. So my answer is most likely uh, it's quite possible. And I but I don't want to be an alarmist either. Uh, but I do want to exp explain the breadth and nature of what was being done and how it developed. And as the Cold War progressed, they would they realized um, their motives changed. It was like, oh my God, we were shooting off all these bombs in the Pacific and in Nevada. What's all this fallout going to do? And what's it going to do to the kids who drink the milk? So that began another wave of experimentation to find out more about that. Um, and so on and on it went. And the military funded a lot of studies, uh, post-war studies with hospital patients in which they were irradiated over their entire bodies um, with radiation. The scientists said this was ostensibly to treat their cancers and to shrink their tumors. But um, uh, some of these patients, uh, the records indicate otherwise, and some of these patients died uh, soon after these exposures uh, from, their, from the exposure and not from the disease that they were suffering from. And the other thing I want to touch on, I'm not going to read any more here because I want to open it up to questions. Um, the other thing I want to touch on uh, is informed consent. Now, that seems to be a really hot topic now that my book has been published. And um, in the when the when this when all this material first started coming out in the 90s, a lot of scientists said, "Well, uh, situations were different then, and um, you know, doctors didn't get consent from their patients to do anything." Well, in fact, the documents, and I'm I'm going by mostly the documents; they're all here in the book, suggest otherwise. Um, they suggest that the scientists, that these were, this was not the dark ages, that these scientists and doctors <coughs> were cognizant of the need to get the voluntary and understanding consent of the patients before they did anything even mildly experimental to them. And when you think about it, it's just good common sense that you would do that. With, with regards to the Rochester patients, uh, Lewis Hempelman, who was the medical advisor to J. Robert Oppenheimer um, and who returned here to the University of Rochester in 1948 where he stayed until he retired. He died in 1992 here in Rochester. Um, he, uh, in the, in the mid-70s, the Atomic Energy Commission did a very quiet uh, investigation into this experiment in which they sent out um, their own investigators around the country they talked to all these doctors and scientists. And to me, that's one of the most revealing parts of this whole story, because the doctors and scientists among them, Stafford Warren, Lewis Hempelman, Heimer Friedel, and so on, uh, could, could not remember anything about this experiment. And even when they were presented with documents, memos with their names on it, they still said that did not refresh their memory. And in some cases, they even um, suggested that the investigators contact someone else. So um, it, uh, it, it was, and, and, and again, that, that, go, that drives right to the heart of informed consent. And it also demolishes this theory that's been floating around that this experiment was somehow therapeutic and that the and this is this is something that's that the University of California likes to say that these experiments were done because the scientists were looking for a cure for bone cancer well if in fact this was legitimate research they they weren't proud of it and they didn't admit it in the 70s in all these confidential memos nobody said that this experiment uh, had had any therapeutic purpose at that time. Again, that was another idea that was spun in the mid-90s um, by various institutions. Um, he, uh, Lewis Hempelman, I started to say, here in Rochester, told the Atomic Energy Commission investigators when they came to interview him, 
and they, after they interviewed these people, the investigators wrote memos to their files. And I have all those memos. They're on the internet. You all can read them too. Um, Lewis Hempelman did say that the patients in Rochester did not know what was being done to them. And in fact, he also said that um, the scientist or doctor who actually administered those injections was not told what was in the syringe. Um, so uh, I, I, I want to, uh, and as far as some of these other experiments that I describe in my book, uh, the Fernald study where, uh, where the boys were fed radioactive oatmeal, the documents show that the, um, the school officials contacted the parents and asked them if, their par if, their, if the children could participate in a study and that they would get lots of milk and it would be nutritious. So, but nowhere was it said that, that this milk was radioactive. And uh, with regards to the Vanderbilt women, um, they were told nothing about uh, this material that they were drinking. They thought it was, co they thought it was vitamins that was going to help their, them and their babies. And, and, and the doctors uh, and scientists who were still alive admitted under oath in depositions to that fact. Um, and, and these women, uh, I, I, I need to add one thing about their study. In the mid-1960s, the Vanderbilt University's researchers resuscitated that experiment much in the same way they did the plutonium experiment. And they called the records on these 800 or so women. And they called the records on a control group who had received no radioactive iron. And they found four fatal malignancies in the children of the of the exposed mothers and none in the unexposed group. And, in, and so in the mid-90s, when a reporter in Nashville broke this story and brought it to light, uh, Vanderbilt University then hired doctors and scientists to demolish their own report that was in the mid-60s stating that these cancers were statistically significant. In other words, they kind of trashed their own findings. And the women in Nashville did not n know that they had been uh, used in these experiments <coughs> until the mid-90s. And uh, some of them, um, many of them self-identified them identified themselves just from the dates and, and what had been reported uh, in the paper. The other thing I want to point out is that one of, the, one of the most astonishing things I found out about the new documents is that, um, and I want to make this clear because um, uh, there's a lot of concern now about uh, China stealing our, our, our nuclear secrets. These documents, there were dozens of documents on this experiment that were not declassified until the mid-90s. There was nothing in these documents that dealt with national security or would reveal how to build an atomic bomb. These documents were kept secret and remained classified for 50 years because the doctors and scientists were afraid of lawsuits, embarrassment, and adverse publicity. And, um, um, it, just to um, demonstrate that, I just want to read from one more memo. Again, this was a document that uh, was not made public until the mid-90s. And what I found as I was researching and looking over these new documents was that I was actually conservative in what I had written, that the experiment was a lot worse um, than uh, and, and the cover-up was a lot more extensive than anything I had written. And I also want to point out that I am a reporter, so I, I don't use the word cover-up. It's a cliché of sorts, and you rarely find cover-ups uh, in our business. It, it, it's, it's, it's a myth. Um, but in, the, in many of these cases, there were legitimate cover-ups. And, and these experiments were covered up from the patients and their families for decades to protect the scientists and doctors themselves. And I, I'm just going to read to you uh, this one quote 
and then I'll open it to questions. It's from a, a declassification officer for the AEC. He's writing in 1947. Um, all the injections are, almost all of them are through. Um, you have a civilian agency that, that's now in control of the bomb project. They're trying to get their feet on the ground. <coughs> There's still some military uh, people I mean, it, there was a, it was a gradual transition process, and um, there was uh, the issue of, of classification and documents came up, and um, somebody wanted to declassify a scientific report on the injections of two of the Chicago patients, Una Mackey and a third Chicago patient who, I, I don't know his name, he's the only one of the 18 patients who is still unidentified. And I don't believe the government knows who he is either. His, the records were just extremely uh, sketchy on this man. Um, and so this declassification offer, officer is writing in, about, about whether they should declassify the document. And he says, this document appears to be the most dangerous since it de describes experiments performed on human subjects including the actual injection of the metal plutonium into the body. The locations of these experiments are given and the results, even to the autopsy findings in two cases. It is unlikely that these, these tests were made without the consent of the subjects. There you go. That, you see, consent. They were sensitive to consent. Um, it is unlikely that these tests were made without the consent of the subjects, but no statement is made to that effect in the coldly scientific manner in which the results are tabulated and discussed would have a very poor effect on the general public. Unless, of course, the legal aspects were covered by the necessary documents, the experimenters and the employee agencies, including the U.S., have been laid open to a devastating lawsuit which would, through its attendant publicity, have far-reaching effects. Now, that was written in 1947, and that man was exactly right. It just took 50 years to happen. So with that, I want to um, open it up to questions. Um, yes? Do you have a range for the amount of activity that was injected in the patients? <laughs> I'll hold it. Do you have a range for the amount of activity in milligrams or micrograms that were injected into the patients? Yes, I do. Um, the patients in, Ro in Rochester were injected with an average of five micrograms of plutonium. A microgram is a millionth of a gram. Um, and that was five times what, what the Manhattan Project doctors at the time thought could be uh, held in the human body without doing harm. So it was five times what they knew was potentially carcinogenic. Um, there were the two, two of, the, uh, of the Chicago patients were injected with 95 micrograms of, um, of plutonium, which was 95 times what they knew could be carcinogenic. Which plutonium? Uh, they injected them mostly with 239, um, and there was a patient, Albert Stevens, who got some 238 and 239. And I should, I should add this about that radiation exposure, because um, the gentleman here seems like he knows something about science. It, it, um, the, the exposure was dependent upon the dose, but it also depended on how long a, a subject lived. So, for example, Ida, who lived for almost 40 years, got a very large dose of radiation. Somebody who died soon thereafter, such as Fred Sowers, uh, got a much lower amount of, of radiation. So, yes? Given, given what you've uh, found out about, about these studies, and since your book has been published, have you heard of any other uh, either either uh, radio uh, involving radioactivity or not involving radioactivity, things that similar to this that went on in the U.S. I'm aware of a lots of other kinds of things, and I know that there are books out there about them. But I, my book was 
very broad as it was. And I had to draw the line somewhere, uh, otherwise I, I would not have a book today. And I'd, I'd still be writing and gathering data. And as a writer, um, there, you can actually become intimidated by your material and, 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 and overwhelmed. And I did not want to become overwhelmed, so I stuck to simply radiation experiments roughly between the years of the early 40s up, up through this. Well, I take the book up through the mid-90s, but so I, I, I'm very narrowly focused in, in my book. Yes. Oh, the, the lady back there, I'm sorry. Me? Yes. I'm curious to know what, if anything, happened to the PIO officer who gave you the um, report in the first place, and if you um, had any follow-up conversations with him. I'm sure he wasn't too happy about this. Oh, uh, the, the, the gentleman who gave me the animal? Yeah. It's, that's, that's very funny because I don't think he knew. He's still in Albuquerque. He's still working at the same place, and I called him. Um, I called him about two years ago when I was writing my prologue, and I, you know, I told him what had happened, and he said, "Oh, well, that's great," and I, I, I don't believe he quite understood um, what what he had done for me. So uh, it was really an amazing uh, exchange that we had. And you had a question here in the front. Uh, I, I did, and, and let me say, uh, uh, Eileen, uh, uh, it's just an honor to have you here in Rochester. You're really tr uh, a true American hero. I, uh, I, I, I'm struck by the number of folks uh, you describe who've been injected uh, or, or t otherwise tested as being either vulnerable or disadvantaged. Could you comment upon the protocols or lack thereof in selecting these folks? Um, it seemed to me that um, in, the, in the studies that I was looking at, oftentimes the doctors and scientists chose which all lump as vulnerable people. Now they could have been terminally ill cancer patients, they used schizophrenics, they used the mentally retarded, they used the mentally ill, they used pregnant women, they used children, they used fetuses. Um, and in my book I have a section that uh, goes back to the ethos at the time and trying to uh, 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 kind of describe what was going on in these doctors' heads. And they said some amazing things. Um, President Clinton impaneled an advisory committee to look into these experiments and those staffers went out and interviewed retired scientists who were very prominent in their field, not just radiation but uh, immunology and and um, hematology and so on. And several of them admitted um, in these interviews, which are all available to you to read on the internet, that uh, oftentimes people of a lower socioeconomic classes were selected for these experiments. And the interviewer asked one of the doctors, well, why was that used? Was it because they didn't ask questions? And he said, that's right, they didn't ask questions. And that when prominent, when children of, this was a pediatrician, and he said when, when um, children of, of prominent uh, families were brought in, well, we didn't use them. So that, and it, that was incredible. Yes, uh, behind Hi. Nice Hi. You. I, I want to thank you for everybody in Rochester uh, and, and the whole country, you, your tenacity has brought this horrible thing out in the public and I, I dearly hope that everybody in this country reads this book to see what can happen in a country supposedly as good as ours to unsuspecting people. You have done us a great service and I appreciate every word of it and it's been a pleasure to have known you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just have to answer Milton. Milton, would you tell everybody, Milton is the son of Janet Stott, who was one of the patients who was injected here in Rochester. And would you just tell uh, everybody here a little bit about your mother, um, why she went into the hospital and what happened? Uh, my mother had scleroderma. And I don't know why they, they put her in the metabolic lab. She had a duodenal ulcer and they slipped her over in the metabolic ab lab and strong claim that they didn't know how she got there. Well, somebody knew how she got there. They did something to her record, so they, they put her over there. And then 
they went through all the experiments and I my dad probably never said a bad word in his life and I've often thought I think he would have really been upset I know he would have been and, and, and some of the things that they had this woman do uh, learn how to defecate and urinate in a container so they can send it to Los Alamos to be checked and it was just it was just a horrible thing and my mother was sick for her whole life and she lived till about age 75 which is like a, in 1975 she died which was horrible and Eileen done a fine job I met Eileen in Albuquerque my mother was pH 8 and I walked up to Eileen and I says I'm Milt Stapp my mother was pH 8 she says oh so glad to meet you I was wondering who pH 8 was and she, this is how this girl dug into this horrible thing that happened to citizens of our country and she's she done just a super job I I got a I thank her again. Thanks, thank you. Thanks. Um, in the in the book, he reminds me of something. Um, I put in a lot of details in my book, and uh, they're difficult, I think, for some people to read. Um, and the purpose in doing that it was not gratuitous. It was to show vividly the level of dehumanization that went on. And I think that's what Milt is getting at. Um, th these, and I'm talking both the scientists y y also here, um, the patients were uh, treated as common laboratory animals. And it seemed to me that as the, the, the plutonium injection went on, they grew ever more callous. And so some of those details are, are, are hard to read, but uh, that's the purpose of putting them in there. Um, uh, let me go to... I, can I oh, say sure. Uh, Excuse me, whoever was next. I called Bill Holmes last night. His father was uh, Albert Stevens. Mm -hmm. And when we met in Albuquerque, he did not have his ashes of his grandfather. <coughs> they were in a university. And he said last night that he has received the ashes of his grandfather. He has no idea if they're all there or not. And he did not even know this book was out. Oh, that's interesting. Well, yes. we, we've got to do but a better want, job publicizing yeah. it. Want, <laughs> yes. We've got to get up there to Healdsburg. Yeah. And, and he wanted to be remembered to you. Oh, well, thank you very yeah. much. And for those of you who are not familiar, just let me, I, I know so much, so I can digress. And I'll try to get back on track. But Albert Stevens was the house painter, the first California patient. After he died, he was cremated. And in the 70s, the atomic energy scientists went to Healdsburg and, uh, or excuse me, his ashes were in Santa Rosa, and uh, had his ashes sent to Argonne National Laboratory where they were studied for plutonium deposition. And what, what, he's, what he's referring to is the fact that the grandson just got those ashes back and it's 1999. Uh, how many years is that? Long time. Okay. Uh, yes, the gentleman in the back. Could you speak to us uh, for a moment uh, from the, just the viewpoint of a writer and as you say, you've given birth to a very difficult and painful book. What's the postpartum period going to be like? Uh, and is, are you going to have another one? Uh, well, um, I started going into the postpartum period uh, when I submitted the, the manuscript. It goes through about a year of editing. Um, and there are long periods of time where I'm just waiting for them to return the manuscript to me so I can make the changes and we can move forward. It, it, I told him, I said, it was, like a, it was like a badminton game, only instead of a, a little light birdie, we had a medicine ball. And the manuscript was about uh, that deep, and we were FedExing it back and forth. So it was a, a, a tremendous uh, amount of work that went into it. And uh, I guess I can only say that uh, people think that when you finish a project like that, like this, that you, oh, you should just you should be be so happy and gleeful. But it just doesn't work that way in real life. It, it, the feeling is one of terror. I think because you know what you've done is you you haven't given birth to a baby you've given birth to a full-grown adult and the question is is that adult going to be able to walk and talk in the world on its own um, or 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 uh, is it going to is that adult going to laugh uh, live and so on so that's 
that's kind of some of my emotions. Well, you referred earlier to as a journalist, you feed the lion. Right. I, I presume that means you write an article and then you move on. Uh, will you move on from this, do you think, or will this be with you as something you're going to continue to work on? Uh, I think that I'll always have a foot in this area and in the book, but I would like to move on and do something new. Um, my husband laughs. He says, oh, Eileen, she doesn't know what's going on. She's been living in 1945 for the past <laughs> decade. And in, in a way, it's true. I woke up, I, f I had the book done, and I realized the 90s had passed me by. And this was a very significant error. I mean, I, I didn't know how to use the Internet. I didn't have email. Everybody's driving SUVs. They have cell phones. I mean, the world has significantly changed in the last decade. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, ge the gentleman back here. Isn't there a victim of the Rochester experiment still living in this area? Yes, there is. Thank you for reminding me, and I have not forgotten this person. And um, if she's here, will she stand up? Mary Jean Connell? I've only talked to her on the phone. I'm Mary Jean, um, I'm going to tell what happened, and then if you want to jump in afterward, oh, you can jump in. But Mary Jean um, discovered in the mid-90s, after these stories appeared here in Rochester, um, she started looking at them, and she thought, you know, that stuff sounds familiar. I think I was used in one of those studies. And as it turned out, um, she had been injected with uranium by the same doctors and scientists working on the Manhattan Project who had performed the plutonium injections. And Mary Jean um, was uh, uh, sent to the metabolic ward because she could not gain weight. And her doctor wanted to find out why she was losing, why she, why she, why she couldn't gain weight. And while she was there, they took her to the animal colony. Remember I mentioned all the animal studies that they did here and at other sites? And um, said the research was going slowly. And Mary Jean said, quote, I think that's when they decided they were going to have me. And so she was injected with uranium, um, not told. She did not give her informed consent about it and only learned in the mid-90s of, of, of her unwitting participation in this study. And um, I think it's been quite a learning curve for, uh, for you, Mary Jean. Do you want to say anything? Or I know you're kind of shy. I'd rather not relive this. <laughs> I'm sorry? I'd rather not relive all that. OK. Well, we'll just move <laughs> on then. OK. Uh, Yes, here. Oh, can you wait till they get over? Okay. 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 Uh, do you know if at Strong Memorial Hospital they did any of these tracer studies on young men or women? I mean, really, children age, because there's a lot of problems with thyroids, right. uh, especially now, those who have grown up. And I wonder if that happened, if you've run into anything like that. Actually, I heard about that today, and I think there have been some news reports on that. And I'm not, I'm not that familiar with it, but it's my understanding that there were a number of children in this area who had their thymus irradiated and um, have had a tremendous number of problems and that they, that these, uh, this group of children have been followed for uh, many, many years. And in fact, I think Lewis Hempelman was involved in some of those follow-up studies. When I was doing my series, somebody, there were so, uh, several people from Rochester sent me documents on the thymus study. I have not written about that in my book. I would suggest you um, uh, check the um, check the public library 
uh, for the news stories on that or contact the, the University of Rochester Strong Memorial Hospital and see what kind of information they have. But there are a lot of reports out there, I think, on that study. Okay, the gentleman in the green shirt. Are any of the main players in this in terms of the doctors and scientists uh, still, still alive? And, and have they had any response to this book? Uh, the, uh, there are, to answer the first part of your question, there are some, uh, the original doc, one, Heimer Friedel, he was the second in command of the medical section. So there was Stafford Warren and then Heimer Friedel. He's still alive. I interviewed him about four times for my series and um, he, his feeling was he was regretful that the experiment had been done, but felt that it had scientific merit and, and probably needed to be done. And I also contacted uh, Lewis Hempelman before he died, and I spoke with him briefly on the phone. And he was one of the major participants and was president, present in Los Alamos at that planning meeting in which Oppenheimer came in and out, and they decided to move forward with the injections. And he said that he couldn't remember uh, anything about that experiment, but as, as, I, as I recall from our telephone interview, he said, well, nobody was hurt. So, um, well, nobody was hurt. So, um, uh, and also there are a lot of uh, uh, scientists and doctors still alive who were involved in the follow-up studies of these people in the 70s, where they were surreptitiously brought, brought into the, into the hospital, brought, brought back here to Strong Memorial Hospital and uh, they, they began an exhumation process in which uh, some of the patients were exhumed. Um, and those individuals are still alive. And uh, I would say the main uh, doctor uh, who was, in, uh, I should say scientist, involved in that study, Patricia Durbin, she still defends it to this day. And in fact, um, not only I, but uh, the paper here interviewed her and she, she, she told both of us that she wanted to um, um, move ahead and write the definitive report when all the dust is settled. And she also at one point uh, said she was willing to, ha for her to be, she was willing to be injected with plutonium herself and that she would then donate her body to science. And the uh, DOE officials quickly said, no, no, we're not in that business anymore. So um, there's, 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 there's a lot, they're very defensive about what happened still. And in fact, Los Alamos issued a statement about my book, I forgot about that last week, in which they said my book um, was, quote, highly speculative and inflammatory. And, um, but my book is based on hundreds of their own records. There's a hundred pages of footnotes in this book, so it's, it's, you can call it many things, but you can't call it speculative. And so, um, yeah, oh, and the, oh, the other thing uh, they did say was they, their, their attitude on consent now in 1999 is, well, um, it's possible that some of these people didn't give informed consent but there are no records proving that they didn't. So there you have it. Oh, this lady here. Um, when I first heard of your work, I immediately thought of Karen Silkwood. You are probably familiar with yeah. that. And I just, I applaud you for your courage. And I wondered if you were ever afraid, you know, for yourself or threatened in any way. No. Um, Somebody asked me that last night, and I said, you know, I really wished I had gotten threatened because it'd make a lot better story. But, <laughs> but I, I mean, the, the problem, I mean, it's, it, it, it was, what I got was stonewalling. Um, and the, 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 the difficulty came in breaking the story loose, in finding those records, and doing all that kind of gumshoe reporting, looking for the names of the patients. Now, Having said that, they're not happy, or some of those people aren't aren't happy um, with what I did. But I think there are others that work for the Department of Energy that are really glad that this came out, um, and um, and uh, have sent me some really nice letters and have even uh, helped me 
uh, get some documents. So it, it crosses a broad spectrum. It's a very emotional, I think it's a very emotional issue for everybody. Um, yes, uh, Paul here. Did you encounter, did you encounter any contemporaneous voices at the time, back in the 40s, who were uh, involved in the Manhattan Project, who were objecting to the experiments? Uh, uh, scientists or gov government officials at the time saying, uh, no, this is not right, this, this, this is not a good thing, let's, let's stop this. Uh, I, have, I have found, I'm trying to think, um, I have found no records in which anybody has said, let's not do this or we shouldn't be doing this. What they say over and over again, whether it's the Army, Navy, Air Force, or Manhattan Project, or Atomic Energy Commission is, once something's done, we can't let this out because lawsuits and so on. Uh, there was, in the mid-70s, there was a whistleblower, and I don't know who that person is, uh, inside the Atomic Energy Commission, after they brought back the survivors into the hospital here, there were three people they brought back. That was Elmer Allen, uh, Edith Schultz Charlton, and John Musso. Um, somebody inside the AEC did raise their hand and said, this is unethical. You can't be studying these people without telling them why you're studying them and what was the purpose of the long ago injection injections and that's what initiated this internal uh, investigation that they did and I think if we didn't have that if that in internal investigation had not occurred a lot of these documents would not have been preserved uh, so somebody did raise the issue in the 70s I have found nobody uh, raising the issue in the 40s uh -huh. Oh, yes, here, this gentleman. It, it struck me at, uh, towards the beginning of the book when you're talking about uh, the scientists working on the Manhattan Project that, that there was a certain amount of self-preservation involved with the beginnings of these studies because they were exposed to this. There, there were, were the, was the concern about the contamination of the labs with the plutonium. And I can, I can sort of understand this sort of selfish motivation to find out what, you know, what can be found out medically about this. But then as you go through the book, it's hard to... It, I have to attribute the rest to sort of a, a groupthink attitude where people are, are continuing to protect these things and, and not let out this information. And it, it struck me that, that this book is a lot, has a lot to do with that, that, that a lot of the subject matter here is this idea of groupthink that, that takes over in an organization where perfectly ethical and perfectly educated people, uh, they're, when they get, get to be part of a group, it's almost as if their, their ethical sense is disabled by, the, by this by this this group thinking um, that's correct and I found it throughout the weapons complex um, this this similar thinking and I think it was just a process of uh, shared ideas and ideals now, many of these men um, uh, had been inducted into the bomb project during the war they were very patriotic um, they felt that the building of the atomic bomb was a very important <coughs> contribution to winning the war which I actually think that it was and that I think that American America had to go ahead and build that build the atomic bomb and so that 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 attitude that 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 fervor if you will carried over into the post cold war period and they felt well we've got to keep these laboratories and factories open because this is important to the nation's security and then of course as the cold war deepened and the Soviet Union uh, the, 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 you know, uh, communism became, uh, the fear of communism grew rampant. I think this even increased that notion. And it was just a, a shared set, set, of, set of beliefs that, that existed at the time. So, well, um, is there anybody else who has a question? Yes, the lady in the back. Do you think this type of experiment will ever happen again? I don't, I, I don't think that, that people will ever be injected with plutonium again. But that's not to say that I don't think um, there's, that, we, that there won't be unethical studies. And the reason I say that is because I'm a reporter and I'm trained to be skeptical. 
and I just feel that um, that there will always be people who step over the line, who will, and, and you can never underestimate the ability to rationalize. Um, the, the people, many of the people in this book rationalized uh, what they did, that it was that, that, that it was going to benefit mankind, or that what they were doing to the patient was 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 harmless, or that uh, the procedure was no worse than some other procedure that would have been done. Um, so, I answer to your question. I think it's quite likely um, uh, that that something like this, if in 50 years, that a reporter could be standing here talking about some other horrendous subject. And again, it's not because I'm, I'm, I'm negative, but it's because I just, I just, I'm a realist. And I think that's just the way the world operates. And so a lot of people have asked me, well, what, what do we do? And, and I, 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 I mean, I can only say what I would, I do as, as a person that, and a citizen and a patient is I, I try to stay involved in my medical care and ask questions and um, know what the doctors are giving me. And I think that um, uh, there's some great doctors out there and we need them. And, you know, they're not all, you know, they're not all going to shoot us up with plutonium when we go in for a checkup. So, you know, it's important to keep things in perspective. So, oh, got some more questions here. This lady in the, oh, wait till they bring that big mic over. I just wanted to comment on that uh, question. Is there another situation arising? And I would say in Desert Storm, such a thing <coughs> did arise because uh, many GIs were inoculated with all kinds of uh, toxins to ward off the so-called bacteriological warfare that they're going to have. And there's many, many GIs that are ill right now. And uh, the government is stonewalling it again and saying, no, it's not what happened over there in Saudi Arabia that's happening to these guys that are sick for no apparent reason. So I think we're having something like that again. Right, and there's been a lot of news reports on that, and it's, it's still a developing story, I think, and is very interesting. The lady in the in the uh, salmon colored sweater. I couldn't think of the word for that color. I just wanted to know, aren't, isn't it possible that there were other people at the Strong who never surfaced and you don't know that they were injected? There are. It, that's certainly entirely possible. Um, uh, but I don't think there are any more people who were injected with plutonium. Uh, certainly the only person injected with re uranium that, that I know of and know, the per know who that is, is Mary Jean Connell, who's sitting here. I don't believe the other uranium p p injectees have been identified, and I know that there were uh, people who were given plutonium, and I don't think they've been identified either. Polonium. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Polonium. I don't think they've been identified. Is that correct? Right. Okay. Yeah. So. To answer your questions, it's possible. Okay, okay the lady with the long hair. Um, what about laws? Are there any laws that really protect us from this sort of thing um, in the last 50 years? <laughs> they have very lengthy informed consent uh, rules now. And I know that there are lots of laws on the book. Um, I'm not a lawyer. Um, and perhaps. Uh, I don't feel comfortable answering that question. That'd be better addressed to a lawyer. So, I'm sorry. Um, there's a, a gentleman in the back with a sweater on. I was just wondering uh, if any of the, the people that were injected were given uh, an apology by the government or financial compensation. I'm glad you reminded me that, because that is an important part of the story. Um, the, after the advisory committee did its work, um, they submitted a 925-page report to President Clinton. And uh, the president did on national television C-SPAN, as a matter of fact, that, uh, that he did uh, issue an apology to everybody who had been used in these studies. And uh, in addition to that, uh, 
there was compensation that was awarded in, in, in civil lawsuits. And I'm going to give you some averages. On average, the plutonium, the families of the plutonium patients received an average of $400,000 minus legal expenses. And uh, the Vanderbilt women received a settlement of $10.3 million. Um, the boys who were used in the radioactive oatmeal study, they they, they, they still have some case, some parts of their cases are still ongoing, but they've gotten one settlement for 1.8 million. Um, there were prisoners who, I didn't get into that study, and it was one of the more brutal ones, I thought, who had their testicles irradiated in Oregon and Washington, many of whom are still alive and some of whom are still in prison. Um, they've, they still have lawsuits pending. Um, and there were, there, there have been other settlements, but, oh, uh, one other big settlement was in Cincinnati. Uh, th that was one of the c cases where cancer patients had their entire bodies irradiated, and there was a, a multi-million dollar settlement there as well. Um, and again, although President Clinton apologized, the advisory committee apologized and condemned these experiments, and Hazel O'Leary apologized. There were still some of the participants who um, who still feel they did nothing wrong and have been unduly uh, smeared in this whole controversy. So, um, I guess I should take maybe one more question. And the gentleman in the back. Uh, yes, earlier I, I believe you alluded to. Um, uh, doctor that uh, gave an injection that didn't um, know he what was he, he was injecting. Um, how many or what percentage of the people that actually did the injecting or lacing the oatmeal actually knew what was what what they were giving patients? I'm going to address the plutonium experiment because that's the one I'm most familiar with, um, and the records are not really clear as far as what the doctors knew when it came to actually the inserting of the needle into the vein. I mentioned that Louis Hempelman said that the doctors here at the Strong uh, who did that were not told what was in the needles. But um, when they had this internal investigation into the experiment in the mid-70s, um, the, the doctors and scientists who had participated in the study and were designated as those who <coughs> mixed, mixed up the plutonium or were actually performed the injections, they denied uh, any, th any involvement whatsoever in this project. And I'm thinking of a doctor in Chicago and a couple of doctors out in California. So basically, we don't know. We just have conflicting records about that. Eileen Wellsom has received the Pulitzer Prize, the George Polk Award for National Reporting, and the Selden Ring Award for Investigative Reporting. Her book, The Plutonium Files, is published by Dial Press.